Discussion on Zimbabwe a bit further. I'm joined in studio by Professor Patrick Bond from Wits University. Professor, welcome. Thanks for your time. Thanks. Good to be with you. Well, we, I mean, we could pontificate the, the politics of this, you know, for days, but what we witnessed last night was momentous, and those scenes of people out on the streets, it was really heartwarming. Um, but I'm, I'm wondering if we're waking up today, and once the celebrations start to fade, um, and we look at the reality that awaits Zimbabwe, what does that reality look like, and should we be cautiously optimistic? Well, after a party like that, there may be a hangover. One version <laughs> of that is political, in which, uh, as Patrick Chinamasa, the legal secretary for ZANU-PF, said on uh, Sunday, he said, we can do it alone. We don't need a uh, government of national unity. We don't need the cooperation of the opposition. Mostly that's the MDC Movement for Democratic Change, uh, whose leader, Morgan Schwangerei, has been treated here yeah. in South Africa for cancer. But he's going back strong, apparently, with Tendai Beatty, his former uh, secretary, and Welshman in Kube. And they are asking for a government of national unity, mm. as are many of the civil society organizations, 100,000 people on the streets. So that would be the optimal. But the hangover is that Patrick Chinamasa, speaking for the new Mnangagwa government may have signaled that's not going to happen. And the second hangover would be economic, whether uh, those folks having to queue in those bank lines for yeah. 5 or $20 a yeah. day maximum, will they get liquidity? Who's going yeah. to come with some hard currency and put them into the banking system, which everyone is running away from? Are they ready for something like a government of national unity? They did it before semi-successfully. That was okay. 2009 to 13. It took uh, our former president, Thabo Mbeki, in his last days in office mm -hmm. to go and, and sort of panel beat both sides into accepting that there would be certain positions for one and the other. Uh, Morgan Schwangerei was the uh, deputy president. Uh, sorry, he was the prime minister. And what... Um, Mugabe had done at that time was make sure that his solid ZANU-PF uh, elite was with him. But since then, of course, he fragmented it. And so yeah. he lost Joyce Majuru, his uh, vice president. Then he lost briefly Emerson and Ngagwe. So it's a, it's a strange party. Is it going to pull back together? Or the pro-Mugabe factions, the G40, going to run away? And they're thinking about that because if they don't uh, have a government of national unity, they'll say, well, we'll just do the election next year. And they think perhaps Ngagwe thinks he can win that. Well, let's, well, let's look at Emerson Mnangagwa because, I mean, I find it hard to accept that a man known as the crocodile and, <laughs> I mean, uh, as somebody who was responsible for upholding many of the uh, repressive policies of the Mugabe regime is not somebody that, that we can look at without some sort of caution. You're right, and it's uh, ironic that there was another great crocodile in our memory, P.W. Yeah. Borta in yeah. South Africa. Um, the atrocities you're referring to would include his leadership of mm. um, the state security apparatus during the Gukurundi massacres of more than 20,000 mostly in Debele people between 82 and 87. There were lots of other uh, atrocities along the way, human rights violations. Uh, one example would be in eastern Zimbabwe where the diamonds are, huge diamonds, $15 billion of diamonds, according to Mugabe, of which only $2 billion uh, revenues can be accounted for. Uh, Mnangagwa, as the defense minister, set up the deals with the Chinese. Anjin was the company, yeah. Sino Zimbabwe. So there's missing money, and there's probably five, six hundred uh, corpses of informal artisanal miners in yeah. uh, November 2008 to be answered for. So Mnangagwa is being looked at very suspiciously because of a record of the things that Zimbabwe has been suffering, repression and looting. Yeah. He's right up there also with Chiwanga, yeah. the army chief. So also, if you, ha if you have a look at someone like Grace Mugabe, who, I mean, she was the tipping point for, for her husband. And people are asking what kind of deals were struck. What kind of deals were struck for, for the First Lady and for the President? Also, what kind of deals were struck for the MDC and the opposition? And, and, and where do they fit in into this new political dispensation? Well, on that last point, I don't think any deals. I think they've been left out in the cold. Okay. There has been talk that the most valuable MDC uh, leader, uh, Tendai Beatty, who's recently reunited with Shangarai mm. and Welshman in Mube, but he was a finance minister and he's the most friendly of this entire grouping to Western donors, whereas Mnangagwa seems to be very friendly with the Chinese and they do need that money. But the deal for Robert Mugabe, for Grace Mugabe, for the two boys who are quite rowdy here in Santon, maybe that they would go to a family place. There's one in Zimbali on the coast, uh, mm -hmm. just north of Durban, near the airport. A big mansion, 300 million rand worth, uh, that his sure. helicopter pilot sort of set up. That's one of the likely scenarios. But then, if Grace comes 
perhaps our civil society and legal uh, beavers will be proce- trying to prosecute her for that uh, t- attack that she did. She was given diplomatic immunity, let out, but you know, there's going to be a lot of questions asked about having someone who's so fresh in our minds was so violent, even if it was simply uh, a little bit of the sort of uh, domestic violence, not mm. mass murders that Mugabe or mm. others have been accused of. I, I think that's the dilemma is, as the EFF says, maybe you do need to bring them here to make sure that transition goes smoothly. There's no residual sort of Mugabe support base that tries to sabotage a new government. And I mean, this transition needs to, it, this transition is, is absolutely crucial and it needs to be handled so well. And you were mentioning uh, the economy and liquidity earlier. But what needs to happen right now to make sure that the, the economy does kind of revive, even if just, you know, for a little while um, at the beginning stages of this, because also Mnangagwa, this isn't a honeymoon for him. He doesn't have time. What, what, needs, what needs to happen now? Well, in my estimation, this desperation uh, period economically in which once Mnangagwa authorizes salaries to be put into his armed services and civil servants' accounts uh, next week and in December, those have to be grounded. You mm-hmm. can't just have bond notes, as they're called, in yeah. uh, Zimbabwe, of sort of fake money without a grounding, that, because they evaporate. Yeah. And people know that we've seen 350% inflation at year on year recently with the bond notes devaluing. And they remember, uh, you know, gazillion percent inflation at the worst point in, in uh, 2008. So my guess is the solution for the short term is some friend popping in money into the financial system. Ironically, you might find that at 10 Downing Street because the okay. British government were trying to say to Mnangagwa, we can be your friend, okay. and more likely the Chinese. But the problem is then the U.S., they have a $385 million fine levied against the big bank there, CBZ, Commercial Bank of Zimbabwe. Okay. If they insist on requiring that to be paid in U.S. dollars, that would really be the, the nail in the coffin economically. So a lot of lobbying now must begin, and whether that's done by ZANU-PF by themselves or with the MDC and, and the sort of full gamut in which you might see Demisa de Bengwa from ZAPU or maybe even Joyce Majuru, the former vice president, work together mm. with the Nangagwa. And then they would say, well, as a United Nation uh, country, let us uh, take some donor funds, hope the conditions aren't so extreme. And that would be the, the short-term band-aid absolutely necessary for the days ahead. Otherwise, we might see more degeneration, degeneration and also uh, popular anger and yeah. the, 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 the sort of feeling of elation and then uh, probably heartbreak as they find nothing changes may take the povo, the masses of Zimbabwe, right back to the streets. And when you talk about the masses, it will be interesting to see how Mnangagwa and the army and the rest of ZANU-PF read the mood of the people. Mm, Because they've used uh, force against the people repeatedly. They've put down protests, but I don't think they've ever seen Zimbabwe, since 1980, has never seen that outpouring of urban support. Mm. Don't forget now uh, that ZANU-PF's support base has been rural to agglomerate the yeah. rural people or what the army did in 2013 to get them to vote uh, and there was a lot of questions about how the army managed a, a big victory for Mugabe in 2013 they certainly have that power in the rural areas mm. but now we're seeing the cities the big cities Harare, Bulawayo and smaller centers uh, reflect and maybe we've seen in Hillbrow and Yeovil last night a sense that the diaspora you know, they were out on Saturday at the Bedford View Johannesburg Consulate at the mm. Pretoria Embassy at the Cape Town Consulate so we might start seeing a Zimbabwean nationhood and, that, and this flag and, and all of this sort of sense of patriotism build that f- political force that is the people's will that I think has been missing. Absolutely. Professor Bond, we'll leave it there. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, Professor Bond from Wits University uh, just uh, taking us through some of the points in the aftermath of that very historic resignation of uh, longtime leader, President Robert Mugabe.